I'm CK. Today we've got a module from Zlob Modular. It's their Diode Chaos module. And I'm going to read the description to you because I won't do it justice summarizing it. Diode Chaos is a unique module. It's never existed before yet. The module is based on a circuit from paper called a simple chaotic circuit with an LED written by Volos, Wang, Jafari, and uh, Kapat Niak. Diode chaos produces three phases of interrelated morphing voltages, including a chaotic trigger out. The range is 20 to 30 seconds, uh, a cycle up to audio rate, although only the X out and the trigonometry out or trigger out go up to audio rate. The frequency is controlled by the rate knob. Each output exhibits different behavior at different rates. X, Y, and Z outs like to stay in the four volts per uh, pulse rate or 4 volts peak to peak, although a different rate the outs can reach 10 volts peak to peak. The trigger out chaotically releases 0 to 10 volts, although sometimes it will spit out minor voltage peaks. So that will be interesting to see what chaotic signaling we can get. And I hope you enjoy the video. Here's the packaging, and as I said, I picked it up from Amazon, not Thonk or Synthone or uh, Synthrotech. So it's kind of a generic package, which is fine. Doesn't mean anything particularly. Cut it open. Nice, except for the bubble wrap on the outside. The inside is at least recyclable paper, and that's good, but bubble wrap is bad, of course. Let's see what we got. Let me look up at the camera, make sure I'm in view. Yes, I am. Oh, it's got a nice little bag. I wonder, okay. Lists their other modules. Made in Chicago, Illinois. Build docks and bombs at zlobmodular.com. Okay, I'll go over there and get that. I'll save that to put in the recycling bin. Open up the package. We'll take a look at the circuit board and front panel first. They've got some black painter's tape. Actually, I don't know what kind of tape this is. I hope it doesn't leave a bunch of residue on here. Ah. Come on, guys, I have a hard enough time opening bags. Peeling this tape is going to kick my abilities. I can't do it. I'll just run the blade through there. And peel this off. No one will be seated during the peeling of the tape portion of our video. Yep, there that didn't all come off straight. Okay, now I can kind of separate that that way. Okay. Okay, I still got this this tape. I don't know why they did it. Nobody else does this. Nobody else has a problem with this. Okay, so this is a fiber front panel, not aluminum. Got rate, got X, got Y, got Z, and... Uh, so that's X out, Y out, Z out, and the trigger out. And it looks like these are translucent, so there'll be LEDs behind them showing when they're firing off. Let's look at the board here. This is, oh, it was designed in 2019. So it's got all... The component values listed. The circuit board looks pretty good. Uh, in memory of Arthur Loesch. I'm not sure who that is. 
all through hole plated and it's got a chip I don't recognize there and this one does not have a value listed for it. Hmm, that's interesting. And here we have the front panel with uh, the LEDs as I mentioned, blue, red, blue, red, red, and transistor, some stand-up resistors. Well that's kind of funky. Okay, bunch of stand-up resistors pin headers, and of course the jacks. Let's see what we've got in the bin. Uh, power connector. A sticker. Your rack modules, DIY kits and PCBs from Slybob Modular. I put that up on the sticker wall. In here, we've got resistors that they have thoughtfully labeled with their values on it, which is always nice. Obviously it's not necessary because you can either read the colors or you can check them on your meter. Check them on your meter is always a good idea just to see what the tolerances are. I've got quite a few resistors. We've got, these are 104's I assume, yep, decoupling caps. A couple of electrolytics, polarized electrolytics. In here, they've got a couple of non polarized uh, electrolytic caps, which you don't see very often, but they're around. And the LEDs, I'm going to just go ahead and dump everything out because that's the kind of guy I am. Let's get our LED buddy out and turn it on. I made this a while ago and I use it all the time to test LEDs, see what voltages they're running. There, I of course have a video on the channel of it. I'll try to remember to link it, but I probably won't. This blue one is pulling 3.1 volts forward voltage, 25 milliamps, uh, needs a 82 ohm current limiting resistor and the red one is coming in at 2.2 volts with 2.1 volts which is pretty standard for red 26 milliamps 120 ohm limiting resistor so let's see what else is interesting oh they gave us little these are kind of oversized knurlies they're pretty big and here are the non-polarized electrolytics as you can see they're marked with an NP, so you don't need to worry about polarity on those. Then in here, these are the chips. I'm gonna get them out if I can get this open. Come on! Ugh. This is a TL072, so that's an op amp, dual op amp, and that's a real Texas instrument part. And then here we have a TL074CN, so that's another. That's not, that doesn't match what it says there. Maybe that number means something else, but this is a, a quad op amp. Now it I don't think that's an official TI logo. This may be a... I don't know. I'm not going to speculate. So that's it. Oh, we've got a 1 meg potentiometer. And, of course, the jacks and a couple of pin headers. So it looks pretty straightforward. So I'll get the soldering iron heated up and... We'll put this little fella together.
Okay, I went to Zob Modular's website. They're based in Chicago, Illinois, USA. And here's their build guide, which looks dandy. Uh, also, you can buy directly from them if you don't want to go through someone like Amazon or not, uh, which I certainly understand. And again, I always love lots of pictures, and they got lots of pictures. And as we usually do, we're going to start with the resistors. We'll start with the 1 megs. Where are they? 1 megs. And just looking at the picture. And the 1 megs are all going to go... We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's easy. Let me put, get them out of the tape. And one thing you may notice, I don't know, it's not earth-shattering or groundbreaking, but when I have resistors that have the values written on the tape, and then I take them out of the tape, I always leave the tape on my soldering pad so I don't forget which resistor type I'm currently using because that's embarrassing. So we'll put one resistor on there and grab the soldering iron and see how the board takes solder. Takes it well and the solder wicks through the through hole plating as it should. So that is great. So now I'm going to put all the rest of the resistors on. And since we've done one, there's not much more to say about it. So I will mute the commentary and speed up the video playback, as well as probably cut some of it out or a lot of it out, because it's time to enjoy resistor time. Breaking back in live for a minute or two, because as I mentioned on the front board, on the pots and jacks board, uh, they have stand-up resistors. And if you haven't done those before, you just take your resistor, fold one lead, one lead over, and this will be a little snaggly because I just unfolded it, to make it look like that, then find where it goes, and you may be able to see here, there's a circle and a line. You put the body of the resistor in the hole that's got the circle around it, and then the other lead goes to the hole that's got the little line pointed to it, just like so. That's all I wanted to say. And that's the end of resistor time for this kit. And on the, as I mentioned, on the pots and knobs board, these are all stand-up resistors. And if you'll notice, and if you're trying to figure out how things get laid out, they're all symmetrical. These three, uh, all the resistors of the same value go in the same positions. Same with the transistors that'll go on them and the LEDs. So that's that for transistor. I mean resistors. Now I'm going to put the diodes on of 4001 for making sure our power is not going to do bad things to us. And there's a good line and diode symbol on the board so you know where the stripe on the diode goes. Because if you put it on backwards, well then, 
the power is just not going to get to the rest of the board and you'll be sad because nothing will be happening. That's that. What else should I do? I think while I'm here, I may as well put the sockets on. Again, I'm not following the build guide. I, sh I should, but this is a straightforward board, so there's nothing for me to particularly do. We'll put that socket down. Where did I put my solder? There it is. Rest the socket on my pinky finger behind the side I'm soldering on. Solder one pin on the socket. Let it cool. Take a look. It's flat, so I don't have to do any more adjustment on that. Do the same for the 072 socket. Check for flatness, and that is not flat. It's all raised up on one side, so we will press on it firmly with our index finger, reheat the solder ball, and that flattens it all back out. Now we'll solder all these pins, and I'm going to grab another piece of solder. Got some the diodes to do also. And that's done. And one thing I did notice as I was putting the sockets on, they put the part number for the chips on the back. So that's 072, that's 074, uh, instead of putting it on the board itself. Neither good nor bad, just reality. Here we have our 104, tenth of a microfarad, decoupling caps. And I clip them out of the tape instead of trying to fight them free. Just less stress involved for the chips and, I mean, the caps and for me. Set that board aside because these will go as decoupling caps. They'll go near the chips. Do you ever want to look and see where see why these decoupling caps are here. You can read about decoupling caps, but you can also look at the data sheet for these chips and it'll show you where these go to reduce a little inductance and a little noise in the power going to these ICs. Okay, so now he would like us to put the three non-polarized 2.2 microfarad caps. And there's a little bit of detail in there that uh, I'll be talking about in a second. And again, these are all non-polarized, so you don't have to worry about polarity. It's interesting, he would like us to put the caps in and then bend them at an angle so it fits a little better in your rig. There's some bent over caps. Now we'll put the two regular electrolytics, and these are polarized. And it's true that when I cut them loose of the tape like this, I lose the long leg, short leg indication, but negative always has the stripe on polarized. And there's, so you put the 
side with the stripe in the hole that does not have the plus sign. Wait to solder that for a second. And now, oh, I see. So the power header is a 90 degree. Okay. So we're going to put it here. And then just like the socket, I'm going to do one pin. And this is nowhere close to being flush to the board. I know that. But I will do one pin and then reheat that and press it down. You might even have heard it click, even though I was yakking, wasn't I? And that gets it flat. So we'll solder these caps and that pin those pins up. Okay. It's not we're not mounting the boards like that. We're going to be mounting them uh, kind of like it'll go kind of like uh, that or so. We'll get when we get to it, we'll get to it. So they're at angles to each other, right angles instead of stacked in parallel planes. So back to this board, and we'll put the, the long pin header here, long legs, go like, come on, so, so as you can see, the little plastic retainer is... on the board that way. Now he, you can solder these here. He, for his own personal preference, likes to solder them on the back. I'm fine either way. I'll go ahead and do it the way he's doing it, just because I have no reason not to, except to be contrary. Again, you might have seen pin header wiggling a little bit. So I'm going to make sure it's flat again. That's good. Also gives me a chance to burn my fingers, which is always a useful part of any project. I'm going to, I'm lingering a little bit on these pins to make sure that the solder really wicks in to the holes. I'm going to double check it. Yeah, I'm getting good flow through the solder holes. And now we have a LED to go on the motherboard. Now this is where you're going to have to diverge. Uh, from the, or pay attention to the picture, it says one LED goes on the motherboard, but then in smaller text, in newer kits, you should have four blue LEDs and four red. The LED should be blue for the motherboard. So instead of putting a red LED, we're going to put a blue LED. And again, there's a flat spot. I mean, not again. There's a clear flat spot for where the short leg the anode side, I mean cathode side, and the flat side of the LED go. So that will be straightforward. So it will go right in there. Now let's make sure it's flat like the other ones. Okay, solder that fella down. That's good. Now, I believe we're all done with this board, 
and yes we are and the <clears throat> I'm sorry the build guide starts with at this point for doing the pots and jacks board but uh, I as you know when I was doing resistors I did both boards just because that's easier for me because I don't have to keep track of half open resistor banks and so on and so forth so I do that uh, you can choose to do it whichever way works for you now I'm looking to see because I think we put the transistors on now but I want to make sure we're not missing something nope we put the four transistors on they're all the same part number and we're going to verify that because things happen oops and they were all 3904s so we're set and we'll put all these in Now we'll put the LEDs on and he cautions us not to solder them yet because we're just going to put them on them. We're going to put the front panel on to make further adjustments. But we want to get these in place because my goal is to put the uh, front panel on once. Did I get some solder in that? I must have gotten some solder in that. Oops, I just sealed it up. That's not going to be helpful. So we'll just kind of put the LED lead in the hole. Heat it up a little bit. Come through. So we got to get the other lead through too. LED on the bottom because even though on the picture on this it says four blue LEDs and four red LEDs well that's not accurate because as you'll recall we already used one blue LED on the motherboard and there's only three spots for blue LEDs, anywho. Put those on, and we'll just leave them loose. And now we'll put the jacks and pots on. Oh, this is one of those boards where the designer or the software has offset the ground pin for the jacks. I don't know why it does that sometimes. I don't know whose board layout software does that. I don't find it a particularly useful characteristic of the circuit board. And then we'll put the pot in, which I should have done first, because it's got the legs that'll make things bounce a little bit when I click them in. No, it didn't. That went together very well. Was I even in frame? I hope I was. So there's the jacks. There's the pot. What does he want us to do now? Washers. Oh, see, he doesn't even say it. Okay, 
So we are going to fit the front panel now. If I can find it, I put it under my pointy thing. So the rate knob goes there. And then we've got all the jacks going through. And I think I'm going to grab my little clamp for a minute. Clamp things together. And now we're going to So now we're going to push the LEDs up against, because again there are little windows here, translucent windows, so we'll push the LEDs all up against those. And I, did I miss an LED? I missed an LED. I'm such a silly person. Where did it, oh it fell out when I was, it fell out when I was looking at that other thing. Okay, we'll put this back in. Again, making sure we've got the short lead in the right space. Okay, now, now. Oh, that's impeding that LED. Now we push all the LEDs up against their little translucent windows. Okay, as we finish these up, I'll show you what I've been doing for the LEDs. So I'm putting a solder on one leg, and then, as you can see here, the LEDs not quite at the little window. So I reheat that solder and use the other lead to position it correctly. Take the soldering iron away to let it cool, and then we're in the right position. Now I'll do what I usually do, which is look at all the solder joints to make sure they're all done and all good, except for the ones that connect the two boards, of course. And I'll do that on this, too, because I didn't. Okay, now we're ready for assembly, but I think he'll want us to put the integrated circuits on here next, I would hope. He actually does not want me to do that yet. Okay. So we're going to take this board like this, this board like this, and we're going to mate all the pins like that. And where am I going to solder these? I'm going to solder these right here. I'm looking at his pictures. And yeah, we're going to solder right along here. So we want to stand this up on edge, and it won't fit my solder slot in the solder pad. So I'll drag my pen of ice out. I may switch to the, you may be seeing this from the side camera, because I don't know if the overhead camera can catch this all that well. And making one more check to make sure I'm doing it the right way. And I am. That's where the pictures here make a huge difference. Okay. 
Now I'm going to turn this all the way counterclockwise and push the knob on. That looks good. Always check when, when you, to make sure you're not pushing the knob so far down that it interferes. Now we'll put the chips on. We'll do the 072 for, uh, yeah, 072, that's right. Yeah, that's a 72. Make sure that the notch on the chip is in alignment with the notch printed on the circuit board. That looks okay. Now we'll do the 074. And there we go. Now we'll grab our power cable and as you can see, hopefully on the motherboard here, negative 12 volt red stripe goes on this end, like so. So we're done. We're ready to put it in the rack. Here's the front. Here's one side. Here's the back. Here's the other side. Here's the top. And the bottom. Now we'll put it in the rack and see how chaotic it can get. So we're in the rack and we're going to give this a little go. Let me block the camera for a second. Now let me go around back and turn the power on. And nothing blew up. And we've got LEDs on the device. Let me take a look through the viewfinder just to make sure. Yep. And as you'll notice here, look at this, it's drawn no power on the negative, no power on the plus five, and no power on the plus two right now. Let's see what the peak was. Oh no, I'm sorry, that was showing peak. So no, it's not pulling any, it's got voltage, of course, but it's not pulling any amperage right now. Let me turn up the rate just to watch. Yeah, and now we're getting some amperage. And as we turn up the rate, you can see it's uh, the LEDs are alternating between blue and red. Can't hear anything now because we don't have anything to hear with. Uh, so the circuit, as it says, circuit go up to audio rate, but only at the X out and the trigger can get up that fast. So before we do anything else, like use it on a, this filter or whatever, I'm going to plug into the X, turn the rate all the way down, bring my volume up on my little amp, and turn, go up and up. And now it's pulling some amperage. It doesn't go very high, that's for sure. So even when we go up to audio, okay, there it's doing an interesting thing there. And now it's kind of staying. Let's move it again. I don't know how I could use that, but he also says the trigger gets up to audio rate, so we'll drag that over there and hear what that sounds like. So it should morph slowly over time.
So that's what the audio rate sounds like. That's just a curiosity. We would never use this, particularly as a... Uh, yep, turn that off for a minute. Uh, we wouldn't use this as a audio source unless we were very desperate for something. Now I'm going to have my little sequencer running. through the saline filter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put CV from X, the X axis, into our modification our CV input to this filter. And now I'll take the rate up. Actually, I'm going to pause the sequencer so you can hear the filter action better. Actually, let me see what I'm doing. Turn that off for a minute. Switch. I'm changing the rate of the input. And the rate on the chaotic is going in again as CV. Let me, I'm going to do steady state on this. Hold on one second as I switch around here. Now we don't have a trigger involved, so this is a steady uh, sine wave going in here. And this rate, as you can see, as it flashes, it's affecting CV here. Now let's see what we can do with if I put the y-axis into, that's going into the volts per octave up here. So now we've got those competing. Now that's both of them very fast. Let's go slow. This can take, uh, I think they say up to two or three minutes. There, hear that? I'm taking the mic off so I can get it closer to the speaker. that to the to the sequencer so we can move through different notes based on the chaotic trigger signal. I'm going to turn the rate up a little bit. variability in the trigger. Let's do one other thing because I've still got the uh, Z plane to do. I'm going to put the Z plane into volts per octave. that's going to sound like.
you can hear it descending, so it wasn't very, the voltage wasn't very high on Z to begin with. There we go. So as you can tell, unless you crank it all the way up, this is all pretty slowly evolving, which is neat. I'm going to dial some more. I'm going to pull this the that back out of Ultra Octave because that's just confusing me. See, there's a lot of evolution going on here. I'm taking that back out for a second. I'm going to take this one back out for the moment. So as you can tell, it's uh, unless you crank the rate way up, it's very uh, slow evolving. And you've got the three planes and go to their website to see actual scope pictures of uh, the voltage uh, envelope they're producing. So it's an interesting thing. to it, it feels like it would be good in the background, in a background drone with slowly evolving uh, filter settings or even uh, CV note frequency, but uh, that I'm, I didn't find as interesting as simply the filter inputs. Uh, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to take the output of this and put it, I think I did this already, didn't I? Yeah. So that's the trigger to the sequencer coming out the trigger. We can make it go very quickly. See, I'm not touching anything there. The trigger sped up. So that's interesting if you want to have a random uh, clock for your sequencer. I'm going to turn it down a little bit. This knob is very sensitive, by the way. Let me go sl a lot slower on the trigger. Actually, No, that's too slow. And that's really fast. That's kind of neat. So 
So that's what it does. Uh, it's interesting again, might be good for a background or, or a steady state underlying uh, tone sculpture underneath something else. Or, I mean, it'd be great sound effects for a video game or a movie, too. So it's a nice little unit. As you saw, pretty straightforward to put together, not too much in it. And uh, quite frankly, if I, I'm going to go to their website again here, and this costs uh, between 60 and, I mean, 20 and $80. If you get the uh, kit directly from them, it's only $50. That's dirt cheap. You want it fully assembled? $80. You want just the PCB? $20. So uh, go to their website, Zlob Modular, Z L O B Modular.com. Uh, they've got some other interesting stuff here that I am certainly going to pick up and uh, build on the channel. So you can be looking forward to that over the next little while or years, depending on how backlogged I get. And as you can also see, we're not drawing much power on this thing. I mean, eight, eight milliamps peak. So it's a good unit uh, and fun. And I hope you enjoyed the video.